name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Beloved, our text from the Gospel of Matthew is filled with rich typology. Matthew's Gospel links both the Old Testament to the New Testament. And in that linking, it draws out the Christ-likeness that we see. In our text, we see how Christ is both the new Moses and the new Israel. Now, typology is just that, likeness. It is how events or figures in the Old Testament foreshadow Christ by being like him, but not quite like him. Typology can also be a matter of similar circumstances. They seem similar to how the events unfold, such as Christ coming out of Egypt or Christ going to Egypt. For example, Christ coming out of Egypt reminds us of the Exodus when God's people left Egypt for the Promised Land. Now in this Gospel we see two things of how Christ is like to us. He is like the new Israel and he is also like the new Moses. And as we go into Scripture further we'll see how these two likenesses will bring out the richness of the Gospel. Our text reads, and the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod. Now our Lord, the moment he was incarnate and born, was under the tyranny of an evil king, Herod. Herod was what I would call a pretender king. He did not have the right to the throne. He was pretending to be the king. So how did he get the throne of David? Well, being the evil king that he was, he murdered, he killed, and he used money and bribery to obtain that throne. Not only did he kill innocent children, which we will read here soon, but he also killed his own brother, his sister, and the heir to the throne of David. And now he is trying to kill the true heir, our Lord. But what purpose does this gain? It doesn't gain him anything. Instead, he forsakes the one who can forgive his sins. And so this should remind us to pray for our leaders, to pray that we have leaders who ground themselves in Christ, to pray for leaders who uphold for justice, and to pray for leaders who respect and protect the church. Indeed, our Lord was persecuted and suffered like we are. Instead, we cling to God and we cling to his word and pray that we might have godly rulers so that the gospel might flourish. The text goes on to say, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I call my son. Now this is where we start to get into the typology that I was speaking of. But before we do that, it reminds me of a verse in Revelation which says, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now in that, that birth of Jesus that we read about in Revelation is a typology, that even the devil, not just the sinful world, desires to hinder the gospel. And so that is why we must fervently pray that the gospel will flourish under not only good government, but under good and godly leaders and pastors. So what about this prophecy that comes from Hosea? Hosea. In it, it says, out of Egypt I call my son. In this, we learn that Jesus is the son, the son, and he did what Israel could not. So take for a moment to consider the Old Testament. I know it's a lot, but think of the major stories that maybe you grew up with as a child. You might think of that uh, movie from when I was younger, it's called, uh, I think, The Prince of Egypt and which depicted the life of Moses. And you may remember the scene, or even recall from the Bible, that the people of God went through the Red Sea. So again, we see that typology in which I want to get into, is that the people of God went through the Red Sea, and in the New Testament we learn more about this, and why the Red Sea was so significant. It said, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, all were baptized into Moses, into the cloud, and into the sea. So here we see that the New Testament tells us that the Red Sea is a baptism, a baptism into Moses. And if you remember a few sermons a while back where we talk about John the Baptist who gets baptized. 
our Lord gets baptized. And in that baptism, it links both the Old Testament baptism of Moses to the baptism of our Lord. And who is baptized in our Lord? You and I are baptized in our Lord. As it says in Matthew, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan and John to baptize by him. This baptism is so significant for us because as we continue to go into the text, it will unfold the salvific history of why Christ had to come and go through the trials and temptations that he did. For in our baptism, it is rooted in the death and resurrection of Christ. And not only that, our Lord went through 40 days of temptation in the wilderness, very similar to the 40 days in the wilderness that the people of God went through. He is also our high priest, much like the high priest of the Old Testament. He made the once and for all sacrifice for us. As again, the New Testament in Hebrew says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. In other words, Christ is everything to us. He must live out a full life so that that life might be given to us so that when the God our, God our Father looks at us, he does not look and see a rebellious son, but he sees a faithful son. And so these typologies are not just interesting little facts that we learn, but are the very substance of the gospel, where it links both Old and New Testament together. Now, the Gospel of Matthew goes on to say that Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old or younger, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. So here we have Herod. Herod wants to preserve his throne, but he's been outwitted by the wise men. And so what does he do in order to kind of protect his throne? He kills an entire city of young babies. As it says in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. These young baby boys were killed on the account of Christ, not because of something they did, not because they boldly made a confession, but it was because of Herod and his lust for the throne that was not his. But we can derive comfort from this when we think about those innocent children that were killed, because being two years or older, they were circumcised. As you know, circumcision was the form of baptism in the Old Testament. That baptism was what brought them into the New Covenant. That circumcision brought them into baptism because that baptism is rooted in the resurrection of our Lord. So how is our Lord like the new Moses? So we see how Jesus goes down to Egypt and comes out of Egypt. Much like Moses has to return to Egypt because his persecutors had died, our Lord has to return to Israel because his persecutors died. And much like Moses leads his people out of Egypt, our Lord will lead us out of our Egypt. That is, he will lead us out of the sinful world and to the world to come, the everlasting world, the new heavens and the new earth. And all of this was done so that it might fulfill a prophecy. That is, all of the horrors that we see in our text, the killing of innocent children, was to fulfill what Jeremiah had written. And he writes, A voice was heard in Ramah, a weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. So here we have this terrible scene depicted. Poor children were killed and harmed for our Lord's sake. And so it makes sense that a mother would weep for her children. So what comfort does a mother have for her children today? Well, much like in the Old Testament, they had the comfort of circumcision, which became baptism for us. We have the comfort of baptism. Because it is that baptism that is rooted in the new covenant. Again, Jeremiah goes on to say, Is Israel my dear son? Is he my darling child? For as often as I speak against him, I do not remember, I do remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. So here we see the fatherly love of our Lord. 
So all of this typology, all of this coming together in the New Testament was to root the covenant people of God, the Old Testament, into the New Testament. Christ reenacts, if you will, the entire life and history of Israel. He reenacts the entire life and history of Moses. So that when God looks at his people, he did not see a rebellious son. And when we see Christ's life in the New Testament from his fasting and temptation in the wilderness to his baptism to his crucifixion, God our Father looks at us and sees not our sinful life, but the life of Christ. And that life is imputed to you, given to you in baptism. And so that is the hope and comfort we have that the Old Testament comes into full fulfillment in the New Testament. And that Moses, our new Moses, Christ, will indeed one day lead us out into the promised land of everlasting life. And that is the hope we have. We, like the holy innocents, the innocent children who were killed, will join the Lamb of God on Mount Zion. In the last days, Christ, our new Moses, will lead his people to the promised land, to a land of eternal life, where Christ, the new Israel, God sees not his rebellious people, but he sees a forgiven people. And to read you and finish off with a text from Jeremiah, it says, For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forget their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. Here everything comes to the head. We are in the New Testament. We are in the New Covenant. And that New Covenant is rooted in the blood of our Lord and Savior Christ. And how do we know this? Not only do we know it because of baptism, but we know it because of the sacrament of the altar. Every time we hear, this is the true body, this is the true blood, given into death for you or shed for you, it is that covenant that we are a part of. You are being brought into the covenant. And so when the day comes, either when Christ returns or you die, our deaths will be brought into the death of Christ. And you will go into that great exodus into the promised land that is everlasting life. That is the hope and comfort we have not only of adults, but of children. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.